live from 7 News, this is Carolina's Family at Four. Good afternoon. Welcome into Carolina's Family at Four. On this Wednesday, I'm Amy Wood. Beautiful day out there. I'm Ben Hoover. Thanks for being with us today on Carolina's Family at Four. Guilty on all three counts. How the country is reacting to Derek Chauvin's conviction in the death of George Floyd. Also on the way today, Governor McMaster announces where the rest of the governor's emergency relief funds will be going. We're going to break down how those $12 million will be used. And cleaning out your closet for springtime can bring scammers your way. We've got some smart ways to protect you and your family. All right, we're going to pull in the chief meteorologist, uh, Christy Henderson. Seven weather, I know, very busy keeping an eye on the wind right now because we have yeah. fire danger out there, don't we? Yeah, that's right. Uh, some of the winds gusting with the dry air, you know, uh, and the drier conditions that are going to be moving in with a cold front uh, does mean a higher fire danger. You can see the winds gusting to 37 miles per hour in Asheville. We've had winds gusting of over 30 miles per hour over parts of the upstate, 32 mile an hour wind gusts there in Newberry. So a red flag warning remains in effect until 8 o'clock this evening. That basically says do not burn anything. It would be way too easy for it to get out of control. Uh, fires would spread very easily and that is in effect for the entire state of South Carolina and a big part of North Carolina. And all those winds are going to turn around to the north and bring in some cold air tonight. So a freeze warning is in effect for Western North Carolina and the South Carolina mountains starting at midnight. That's what we expect a freeze to be likely and then we'll stay above freezing around the upstate. But if the winds die down enough, some frost could form and a frost advisory in effect from 2 a.m. until 8 a.m. tomorrow. Tonight's low temperature, as I mentioned, should get down below freezing, ranging from the upper 20s to low 30s in the mountain areas, 33 to 37 around the upstate and northeast Georgia. We'll check out the rest of the forecast coming up for you in just a few minutes. Amy, Ben. Christy, thank you. The U.S. Justice Department has launched an investigation into policing practices in Minneapolis. It all comes just one day after a jury found former police officer Derek Chauvin guilty of murdering George Floyd. Michael George is covering the story from Minneapolis. A young girl was among those who brought flowers Wednesday to the memorial at the spot where George Floyd died as the jury's guilty verdict in the Derek Chauvin murder trial sinks in. We were all crying. We were all in tears. Mario Suttles lives in the neighborhood where Dante Wright was killed by police just last week. He wants his four-year-old Farah to see change happen in America. What we're most focused on is how can we reform the police and how can we make it safer for our children and, and for everybody's children. Floyd's brother says he started praying once he heard there was a verdict. The moment I heard guilty, guilty, and guilty, I was excited, I was happy. The Minnesota Department of Corrections released a booking photo of Chauvin taken shortly after the jury convicted the former Minneapolis police officer on all three charges. Unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland announced an investigation into policing practices in Minneapolis. It will include a comprehensive review of the Minneapolis Police Department's policies, training, supervision, and use of force investigations. Here in Minneapolis, people are all too aware that Chauvin's guilty verdict is only the beginning. They believe without police reform, what happened to George Floyd could happen again. Yes, we do welcome this verdict, but we know that the fight is not over. Chauvin is being held in a restrictive housing unit separated from the general population at the maximum security prison. He's scheduled to be sentenced in about eight weeks. Michael George, CBS News, Minneapolis. The three other officers who are accused of aiding and abetting George Floyd's murder are expected to go to trial in August. The president of the NAACP Greenville chapter believes that Chauvin's guilty verdict can be a turning point. Reverend J.M. Fleming says the decision was a moment of hope for stronger accountability in the future. He adds that during his years fighting for justice, he's seen lots of disappointing outcomes. We have known for this day uh, so much was tied up in this trial. It was not about uh, Floyd himself. It was about all the others who died before him and they found no justice. To indicate my opinion. 
Buncombe County Sheriff Quentin Miller said in a statement that law enforcement, quote, should not and cannot condone the abuse of authority within our ranks. The murder conviction Tuesday of this former Minneapolis police officer is spurring fresh momentum on Capitol Hill to address police reform. While Republicans and Democrats agree on issues like more body camera use, there are still some sticking points. Natalie Brand explains. From the family of George Floyd, we're going to fight for everybody, to the President of the United States. We can't stop here. Recognition that Tuesday's guilty verdict for former police officer Derek Chauvin is just step one. We have to focus on transforming policing in the United States. California Congresswoman Karen Bass is among those leading efforts on federal police reform legislation. The bill is passed. Just last month, the House passed the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. It would ban chokeholds and some no knock warrants and prohibit racial and religious profiling. But overhauling qualified immunity protections for police, which would make it easier to hold officers accountable in court, has been a non-starter for Senate Republicans. Republican Senator Tim Scott says he's working on an alternative proposal on qualified immunity that would put more burden on police departments instead of individual officers. I'm sure he's updated a few things based on uh, more current events, uh, but uh, expect to see a really good bill coming out soon. At least 319 people in the U.S. have been killed by police so far this year, according to MappingPoliceViolence.org. The group says in recent years, the vast majority did not result in charges against the officer. I think it's time for us to have a commission to take a deep dive, deep look, uh, evidence-based approach to how will we imagine policing for the next uh, couple of hundred years. Miami Police Chief Art Acevedo is calling on President Biden to launch a national oversight commission that he promised during the campaign. The White House says it will focus on legislation instead. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Capitol Hill. House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer said today he expects the Senate to amend the House bill, but he's hopeful that progress on passing something out of Congress could come in the next few months. Greenville County Council is considering a gun ordinance that would keep local law enforcement from enforcing laws and regulations that restrict gun ownership, accessories, and also ammunition. Last night, Council Member Steve Shaw proposed an ordinance that would prevent deputies from enforcing what it defines as unlawful acts regarding guns. This proposal includes restrictions on gun ownership and regulations on accessories like bump stocks. A spokesperson for the sheriff's office says the ordinance would not change anything because deputies cannot enforce federal law anyway. County Councilman Ennis Fant tells 7 News he is concerned about the proposal being constitutional. It creates no new gun law. It takes away no gun law. It just simply says that we in Greenville County will not spend our money and our resources enforcing federal law. If we just do something for the sake of doing it that has no teeth. Um, and it's not enforceable, what does that accomplish? Other than stir up a segment of the community and get them excited for something that really has no true meaning. For now, the proposed ordinance has been referred to the Public Safety Committee. Governor Henry McMaster is using federal relief funds to keep children out of the state's criminal justice system. The money will be coming from the governor's emergency education relief fund. Our Jason Raven has more now on that announcement. Governor McMaster says the over $12 million in investments will help prevent the youth of South Carolina from having to spend time behind this fence. Governor McMaster, DJJ officials and others made the announcement Wednesday morning and they say this will help expand their juvenile delinquency prevention programs across South Carolina. Now here is how the federal relief funds will be spent. $4.8 million for community-based and evidence-based therapy programs, $4 million for summer and after-school programs for at-risk youth in rural areas, $2 million for full-time mentoring programs, and $1.25 million for teen after-school centers. The ultimate answer is to keep the young people from getting off the right track. It is mighty easy today for a young person, uh, particularly with the effects of the, the virus and, and all the ramifications there. It, it was easy to get all on the wrong track before, and it's even easier now. The GEAR Fund was created under the CARES Act passed last year. 
In Columbia, Jason Raven, 7 News. State lawmakers today passed a joint resolution requiring every school district in the state to offer five-day in-person learning to students no later than April 26th. Right now, 76 districts across South Carolina are already doing that, offering full face-to-face -face instruction. Three districts, including Greenville County, are offering hybrid learning. They will need to transition to full in-person learning by Monday. Well, the Greenville Swamp Rabbits hockey team will be going pink to stick it to cancer. Pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Players took a tour of Cancer Survivors Park in Greenville this afternoon, a beautiful place, to learn more about the impact cancer has on families right here in the upstate. The hockey team wore special cancer awareness themed jerseys during the tour. You could see that. And they, of course, are going to be auctioning those off later to benefit the Cancer Survivors Park Alliance. So we hope everybody comes out and supports the game on May 1st, and I hope they win. But more importantly, to, to bring awareness to cancer survivors and survivorship and this beautiful space in downtown Greenville that a lot of people don't know is here to honor and celebrate survivors. They stick it to cancer event. It's going to be taking place May 1st, as uh, Kay was mentioning there at the Bon Secours Wellness Arena. Much more information on where you can find tickets. It's over on the d website, the dot com, WSBA.com. Well, spring is the time to clean and maybe to sell some things that you want to get rid of. But keep in mind, you might attract scammers if you go online. 7 News reporter Christine Scarpelli spoke with experts at the BBB for some tips to keep you safe from scams. Especially with spring cleaning, a lot of people want to get rid of their items. Selling online is no problem, but there are plenty of scam artists that are also hanging around these popular sites that want to take your information, maybe even your money, if they can get it. V. Daniel, president of the Better Business Bureau in the Upstate, says con artists pose as buyers very often. They may offer to overpay for an item. They could ask you to make a transaction in a link outside of the selling platform. Be careful, she says. They often ask for personal information or banking information they should not need. Also, use caution when meeting strangers in your local area. Don't give out your home address. Go to a public place like a police office or a parking area. Don't Ship items before you receive payment. The BBB says they saw plenty of scams during the pandemic. Yeah, in 2020, our top two scams were online purchases. Um, you know, people were on home more due to COVID, and actually pet scams. It's a little bit crazy, but you know, people do go online and buy pets. I've listed those tips and plenty more at our website, WSPA.com. It's all right there. Better Business Bureau of the Upstate. We're from Greenville. Christine Scarpelli, 7 News. Coming up on Carolina's Family at Four, ahead of tomorrow's Weather Impact Day, we're taking a look at how you can protect your plants as those temperatures drop tonight. And a little later, farmers fighting climate change, how the Biden administration hopes to grow their movement.
Well, with the nice weather we've been having lately, we know a lot of you have already started to fill those beautiful pots on your front porches and planting your gardens. That's right, but with the potential for these freezing temperatures overnight, that weather impact day we've been talking about and into tomorrow morning, what are the best ways to protect the plants, the new plants of yours? We sent 7 News reporter Scotty Kay to figure this out. We all know our weather can be a little unpredictable and we don't want all of that hard work we've done in our yards to go to waste. Those here at Roebuck Greenhouses know how to keep plants beautiful, no matter the forecast. John Burnett works at Roebuck Greenhouses and says he's seen a lot of people there recently ready to get their spring gardening on. He says normally planting around this time of year is not a bad idea as frost is not super common. But with the forecast showing low temperatures overnight, Burnett says plant owners will need to take action as some plants are more sensitive to cold weather than others. If you have annuals and bedding plants, he says those are the ones potentially in danger. Burnett says some people may use plastic to cover them, but he says a sheet, a box, or pine needles are usually better. And for smaller plants, even a bucket will do. If you choose not to cover your plants, there's another option. You can get up early and gently spray the frost off. Annuals such as begonias and patience, vinca or periwinkle if they've already planted it, um, all that really needs to be covered. You can take a sheet, cover it with a sheet. Burnett says whatever you decide to use to cover up your plants tonight, make sure you weigh it down as wind may play a part in how well your plants are protected. In Roebuck, Scotty K, 7 News. That is a really good idea. I never heard of that one. Just take your pine straw and put it on top of the flowers that you have planted. Good thing we did that, that story. That's easy. Let people know. All right, let's check back in with Christy. Of course, she's yeah. got her eye on these uh, dropping temperatures tonight exactly. and also this uh, burn uh, situation going on. The uh, the fire, the what, what is it? Red flag fire warning. A red flag warning uh, yeah. is the one that's in effect. Now there's going to be a red flag alert for both today and tomorrow from the Forestry Commission, which means basically just hold off on your burning until we can get some rain in the area. The ground is dry, the air is dry, it's windy out there today, and of course we expect to freeze in the mountain locations tonight with frost possible in some parts of the upstate. So good advice there on covering plants. You're going to want to do that if you're worried about any of the plants that you've just put in the ground. Near record lows of possibility tonight in the Asheville area. And look at the change in temperature. We're in the 40s in Asheville, 80s along the South Carolina coast, 81 now in Myrtle Beach. Uh, it's 82 in Charleston, the front making progress across the Carolinas this afternoon. For tonight, we're gonna get down to around 35 for the upstate. So we'll stay above freezing, but if the winds die down enough, that will allow some frost to form in some areas. And then for the mountains, we'll get down to around 29 for tonight. That would be enough to break a record low into tomorrow afternoon with a lot of sunshine and lighter winds. We'll get up to around 64 for the high. Friday is still dry. Saturday is another weather impact day because rain arrives. That's good news. We need it and it's going to rain all day long. Back to sun on Sunday. There's mountain forecast for tomorrow after a freezing start to the day. We'll get up to 56 for a high. Good chance of rain in the mountains as well on Saturday. Amy, Ben. Thank you, Christy. Farmers are often the first to feel the ramifications of climate change, and many are starting to fight back from the ground up. Natalie Brand takes us to Maryland, where one farm is already making a difference with climate smart techniques. Trey Hill lives the impacts of climate change as the seasons cycle through his Maryland farm. Our springs are colder and wetter, our summers are hotter and drier. I mean, it's it's something that affects my livelihood and affects the, the future of my farm. But he's learned ways to fight back. The fourth generation farmer started adopting climate smart farming techniques 20 years ago. He plants cover crop after harvesting his commercial crop to keep the soil nourished during off season. Balanza should be out here as well. And he avoids tilling or plowing to keep the dirt intact. That's what soil should look like. Scientist Ray Weil says this soil is actually capturing greenhouse pollution. What is does that mean to climate change? Lots and lots of carbon that was its carbon dioxide in the air is no longer in the air. It's now in the soil and it's going to stay here. Hill is working with a Seattle startup company to help measure how much he's reducing his carbon footprint. You have to 
sequester the carbon prior to marketing your credits. We sequester roughly one ton of carbon per acre per year. Not only a boost to the environment, but his bottom line. He sells his carbon credits on a marketplace where businesses or individuals can support the cause. So I get to pick my price. It's essentially an auction block. I sold carbon credits, bought this. It's a win-win the Biden administration hopes to encourage. It could be that agriculture and forestry could account for as much as 20, 25 percent of our response to climate change. Robert Bonney, a senior advisor on climate change at the USDA, says the agency is working on developing new tools, maybe even a carbon bank, to bring more participants to the table. We can get more investment into agriculture and forestry and benefit the climate at the same time. Well, I think the opportunities are endless. Ultimately, the goal is to encourage a new crop of farmers like Trey Hill, paving the way in a growing field. Natalie Brandt, CBS News, Rock Hall, Maryland. The USDA is currently soliciting feedback from farmers. They're holding a series of meetings with people in agriculture and forestry to talk about the next steps for reducing emissions. It is Workout Wednesday, so coming up, we're going to hear from our fitness consultant, Justin Bowers, about how to navigate the gym. Guys, my name is Justin Bowers. You're WSPA Channel 7 fitness guy. One of your viewers sent me a message via DM on social media at Justin Bowers Fit. Follow me on all social media at Justin Bowers Fit. Feel free to ask me any questions. I reply to all messages, except for Grandma continuing to ask me to come over and mow her lawn. One of those questions that I got asked recently was Justin. How can I navigate the gym as a newbie, as someone that doesn't know what they're doing and really doesn't know which machines to go to or what weights to use? That is part of the journey, guys. Okay, look, we've all 
had a day one. Those of us who have been training for years, those of us that just started, all of us have started at ground zero, so it's okay. You're going to make mistakes. Um, one of the things that you have an advantage of in 2021 is that you can utilize uh, the internet. You can utilize Google, YouTube, things of that nature to do a little research. That way you can go in at least with a plan. Look, you are going to make mistakes. That's probably most people's fear. They're going to go into a gym, not know what to do, and probably use a piece of equipment uh, incorrectly. You're going to do that at some point. That's okay. This is where the growth comes. This is where the learning comes. And then you all of a sudden, once you learn it, you never forget how to use a machine. So it's okay. Look, uh, watch YouTube videos on proper form, proper technique, okay? Find a program, find a style of training that you like. Also, I know a lot of you might be reluctant to do so, but those of us that have been in the gym for years, some of those bigger guys that you see walking around or some of those ladies with muscles uh, the size of my torso, um, they're actually some of the nicest people ever, and they love, 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 love to help. They love it when someone asks them questions. So don't be afraid to go up to these individuals, ask questions about how to use something or have them watch your form or any other questions you might ask. Ask the staff, ask people who look like they know what they're doing. Ask trainers that are walking around. It's okay, they love, love, love giving advice. That's why they learned it, that's why we've gone to school for this. So definitely utilize that information. And one of the best advices that I usually give over and over and over again is have a plan. Now, if you've, only, if you've never worked out before or you're on your first week, you don't necessarily have to have an actual plan. Go to the gym, get used to the movements, but at some point, definitely pick a program, follow a program. There are many, many available online. If you have any questions, you can ask me at Justin Bowers Fit on Instagram, Twitter, and of course, Facebook. So once again, as a newbie, just jump right in and you'll find out that you'll be swimming with the fish soon enough. My name is Justin Bowers. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on Workout Wednesday. And next on Carolina's Family, pushing back from the community over a proposed RV park. A look at the location and details of that park next.
Welcome back. A proposed RV park in Spartanburg County has some neighbors banding together to stop the development. 7 News' Kimberly Brown is joining us live in Campobello with the update on what's happening, Kim. All right, Amy, you know, a lot of people out here own acres of land. It's farmland. We are just off of Interstate 26. This is where a lot of RVs would travel up and down the road and they could just jump off. But some of the homeowners say putting an RV park right in the middle of farmland would bring unnecessary traffic and also change the scenery. The name of the RV park is called Tea Tree Farms. It's the proposed park would have about 50 spaces for portable trailers on a portion of 38 acres of land off of Landra Mill Road. Spartanburg County Council says that the land is not part of any covenant group and does not have any restrictions, so the owner of the land is free to do what they want. Aside from concerns about traffic, safety, and sanitation issues, concerned homeowners describe this area as a conservation-focused area, and neighborhood associations forbid commercial use of their properties. The people that I represent in District 5, those people are number one in my list. Now, if we've got a developer that wants to come in and buy a piece of property, then okay, he has rights. We didn't really ever dream that any, anyone would want to develop something so incompatible with the surrounding land uses. Um, and so we are, we're shocked, we're outraged, and, and we're going to do what's necessary to, to, put a, to, to put a stop to it. Well, at Monday's council meeting, the councilman there, Bob Walker, he requested a meeting between the homeowners, the county council, and also the contractor. There is a side note, though. We did reach out to the contractor, have yet to hear back from them, and we wanted to hear their side of the story and just kind of get them an op give them an opportunity to explain what they're planning and trying to do. However, we haven't heard from them as of yet. The council has not put any um, bids out or tried to do anything about the infrastructure at this point, and so now the project is still at the point where they're just having conversations, and we'll definitely keep you posted on any meetings and conversations to come. Reporting live in Spartanburg County, Kimberly Brown, 7 News. Thank you, Kim. The South Carolina Forestry Commission has called a red flag fire alert for today and tomorrow. We've been talking about that. I spoke with Brad Bramlett with the SC Forestry Commission to find out what exactly that means. Brad, thanks for being with us. It sounds like you're encouraging folks across the state to put off any sort of outdoor burning plans for the next couple of days. What led to that decision? Yeah, Ben, with the high winds and low humidity, those uh, make for the right conditions for the elevated fire weather. So, yes, we're, act we're actually asking for the public to postpone outdoor burning. And so this is, and you're encouraging folks, this is not a burning ban. Uh, but, you know, how does this apply to folks at home? You know, I know a lot of crews that work with heavy equipment around wooded areas. This really applies to them. But folks at home... I would imagine fire pits in the backyard are a bad idea right now. It is. What happens is under normal conditions, uh, light winds and elevated humidity, they may could successfully do a burn, burning leaves, grass clippings, and that type of thing. But when you get the winds up like they are in the low humidities, it makes it much more difficult and just a little spark or ember getting away from them could start a wildfire. All right, so that alert is in effect until the end of the day on Thursday. And our chief meteorologist, Christy Henderson, is watching those winds. Yeah. And that's the story, right, Christy? These winds. Yeah, yeah it really is because it, it just takes, you know, a, a wind gust to blow an ember, you know, down the yeah. way and, and get a wildfire going. So that's what we really have to be careful about. And, and uh, as Ben was saying uh, with Brad, you just have to kind of use your common sense, even though it's yeah. not a burn ban. It's just not a good idea right now with this dry weather we have. And of course, cold, dry air moving in tonight. Uh, those winds are out of the north in Asheville. That's really kept the temperature chilly this afternoon, blowing at 23 miles per hour sustained, blowing at about 10 to 20 miles per hour across the upstate with higher wind gusts. Some of those winds have gusted over 30 miles per hour across the area so far today. Well, the cold front's marching through the Carolinas. We're at 45 in Asheville. 65 at GSP, 70s in Columbia, and 80s over towards Charleston. That cold air is going to filter all across the Carolinas and as far south as Florida by tomorrow morning. There's your pinpoint planner for Spartanburg. We'll get down into the 40s by 10 p.m., 40 by 2 a.m., and then going into tomorrow morning, we'll start the day in the mid-30s. Lots of sun in the forecast tomorrow. 
Asheville's going to step down into the 30s by midnight and then we'll get down to around 30 31 degrees by six o'clock in the morning, staying at freezing through about eight o'clock. Sunny weather will get us into the 50s for the high temperature. So again, tonight's going to be critical for folks to put some plants in the ground in general upper 20s to lower 30s around western North Carolina with uh, mainly 33 to 37 the range on the low temperature for the upstate. Ben, Amy. All right, Christy, thank you. As the nation reacts to Derek Chauvin's conviction, a first of its kind study shows the impact police killings have on the mental health of many black families. Elise Preston breaks down those findings. Committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. The George Floyd case has gripped the nation. For Richard Parker, seeing another black man die after interacting with law enforcement is overwhelming. It gets difficult. Um, I don't want to live in a constant state of rage and anger and fear, so... Sometimes I just try to tune it out, and I hate to admit that publicly, but I got to protect my peace. A new study from a group of U.S. researchers shows the significant negative toll police killings of black Americans has on the mental health of other black Americans. Weeks where we have two or more incidents of these high profile acts of racial violence. Um, black Americans report a higher number of poor mental health days. The study analyzed nearly 50 highly publicized incidents from 2013 to 2017, including cases involving Freddie Gray, Philando Castile, and Michael Brown, where officers were not convicted. We find that it's the legal decisions to not indict uh, or convict officers that's the strongest or only significant predictor of the poor mental health days. Previous studies estimate one in 1,000 black men can expect to be killed by police. Researchers say it's critical to address racial violence and the public health impact. Parker believes much more work still needs to be done. And what about everybody else, you know, who have lost their lives? Where's their justice? Like, we can't just celebrate one when the system is still broken. He's happy there was a conviction this time, but he'll keep fighting for a world where police violence doesn't exist. Elise Preston, CBS News, New York. Subaru is recalling nearly 875,000 cars and SUVs. Apparently the engines can stall and rear suspension parts might fall off. Well, that doesn't sound good. The engine issue is for cross-track SUVs from 2018 and 19, along with the Impreza cars from 27, three, 2017 to 2019. The suspension problem is for the same cross-tracks and the 2019 Forester. The recalls begin next month. If you use Venmo, now you can buy cryptocurrency. Venmo, of course, is a mobile payment app owned by PayPal. A lot of people use it. Uh, the new feature will let you buy, hold, and sell Bitcoin and three other digital coins. Venmo will have in-app guides and videos to help people like me learn more about <laughs> crypto. Me too. <laughs> Lots to learn well, there. Well, 8 billion sauce packets from Taco Bell are used every year, and they may soon get a second life away from the trash. The fast food chain's partnering up with TerraCycle this is a company that collects non-recyclable materials, melts them down, and remolds them into hard plastics. They then can be used as something new. Not much else is known, but Taco Bell promised participation in the recycling program will be easy. Well, a lot of people think soccer is one of the most beautiful games in the world. It is a beautiful game, but a pro team in England has the world on its mind, advising other teams from Europe to the U.S. on their carbon neutral approach. Mark Phillips shows us what may be the future of sports in a climate changing world. The rules of the game we call soccer, but which the Brits who invented it understandably call football, haven't changed much in 170 or so years. But at this minor league team in a small town a couple of hours west of London, soccer, sorry, football, is being reinvented. Forest Green Rovers are the world's first vegan, carbon neutral, professional sports team. And they got here because they were so bad. So it wasn't winning, and it wasn't making any money. <laughs> yep. The Rovers were about to go under when Dale Vince, the owner of a locally based renewable energy company, stepped in to save them. Did you have the big idea then that you would take this long established club that was in financial difficulty and not just rescue it but turn it into what it's become, this kind of ideal? No, all of that kind of grew organically. Like I say, it was without any thought other than saving the club. And then um, 
everything else became apparent one thing at a time. The first thing that became apparent was that Vince, a longtime vegan, found himself not only in the sports business, but in the meat business. Not for long. You owned a team that fed, fed its players meat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> did, did it horrify you at the it time? It horrified me. The club not only stopped serving meat to the players, they stopped serving it to the fans when there were fans before COVID. And a funny thing happened. Everybody liked the food. Former carnivore players like Dan Sweeney say it even improved their game. What are the benefits? Just faster recovery times. Um, before games, pre-match, you feel like you've got way more energy. Is really? That? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then another funny thing happened. The team started winning. They're now fighting to move up into a higher division of the English league system. Being vegan is one thing, but how do you make forest green really green? Not that hard. The club now powers its park with wind turbines and solar panels. It plays on an organic field. No chemical fertilizers here, just seaweed. Even the water they use is collected and used again, but still. How do you go carbon neutral? You're, you're in the sports business, you go to away games, your fans travel, all this stuff eats up, uh, eats up energy. You've got to measure your carbon footprint first, then you've got to do what you can to reduce it, and then what you've got left that you can't reduce, you offset uh, by a scheme that absorbs carbon in some other way. So the field is organic, the players are vegans, the power is renewable, what's left? The uniforms. Right now, they're bamboo, but next year's are going to be made out of used coffee grounds. Seriously. And the next step, a new stadium built not of carbon-hungry steel or concrete, but out of wood. The question to keep coming back to is why? Are you trying to create an example here? Is it just part of your own personal approach to life that you want to run a business this way? Do you know what it's both? That you happen to have a football club soccer we call it and that you could turn it into and run it the way that you wanted to run it. yeah I, I run everything the way I want to run it <laughs> <laughs> for CBS I'm Mark Phillips at Forest Green Rovers Neat. coming up on Carolina's family at four millions of Americans are ready for a vacation how about you a look at where everybody's going next
A vacation was really just a dream for all of us last year because of the pandemic. But with vaccinations accelerating, Americans are making up for lost time. We get the story from Dania Bacchus. At airports nationwide. You're looking for some fun in the sun. People are taking off. Many for their first vacation since the pandemic started. We've been just cooped up in the house for too long right now, so just excited to get out. And the great getaway is expected to continue through the summer months. A new survey from the Points Guy finds half of U.S. adults are likely to take at least one vacation between June and September. A lot of them are planning on spending a pretty significant amount of money. In fact, over more than four out of 10 are actually anticipating spending more than $1,000 on these vacations. But many won't be spending that money on plane tickets. Nearly half of those traveling plan to take a road trip and beaches are one of the most popular places to go. But national parks are the top destination. There's going to be a huge demand for visiting these attractions. So make sure you do your research and lock in those plans early because they're just going to get more and more filled up as we approach the summer. Nick Ewan from the Points Guy says those traveling internationally will likely need to provide a negative COVID test. Make sure you understand what it's going to take for you to get in and then what it's going to take for you to get back to the United States. And bear in mind, a lot of those things can change on a dime as case counts go up or go down. Ewan says no matter where you travel, it's important to do your research and plan ahead. Don back is CBS News, Los Angeles. Ewan says people who expect to use a rental car need to book early because they are in short supply. Well, don't be surprised if you see a 27 foot long hot dog on wheels driving around the roads of the upstate. As many times as I've seen it, I <laughs> am always so impressed. The to. Oscar Mayer <laughs> Wienermobile will be making several appearances starting tomorrow afternoon in Simpsonville. The Wienermobile has been around since the 1930s. Didn't know that. You'll be able to see it in our area and take pictures. Its crew will also be handing out weenie whistles. <laughs> <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Weenie whistles for everyone. Oh boy. The Wiener Mobile <laughs> will be in Greenville, Spartanburg, Greer, and Fountain Inn tomorrow through Sunday. So be on the lookout. That thing is like quite the sight on the roads. I cannot even imagine like that dangerous stretch toward Gaffney. Please don't put the Wiener Mobile in there. We don't need that. Please. Yeah. No, that would uh, that would be turning heads for sure. I wish mm. they were handing out free hot dogs though. I'd be first in line. That mm -hmm. would be great. Wouldn't that right? be great? Mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. I have to eat, I'm one of those people that has to have ketchup on the hot dog. I don't know about y'all, but I am too. Okay. It's no. a big debate about that. Some people say you don't put ketchup on a hot dog. No, absolutely not. You don't Go put on. that on a hot dog. Okay. Well, it's two against one, Ben. We win <laughs> on this one. <laughs> well, speaking of ketchup and red, I've got a red map here behind me trying to make a transition here. Uh, we have a red flag, war red flag warning in effect until eight o'clock this evening. The ground is dry. We've had gusty winds all day and low humidity, so uh, it makes fires easy to spread if they get started. Lighter winds are in the forecast for later tonight, and of course, very cold air is moving in with those north winds, so a freeze warning in effect for tomorrow morning across western North Carolina and the South Carolina mountains, and a frost advisory in effect for the upstate 2 a.m. to 8 a.m. tomorrow. So your forecast tonight calls for a low down to 35 for the upstate. So above freezing around the upstate, but we do expect some frost to form in some locations and then the mountains get down to 29 for tonight. Clear skies and the forecast going into tomorrow. So after a cold start to the day, we'll end up around 64 for the high 38 for tomorrow night. 68 the high on Friday into Saturday. That's another weather impact day with a good chance of rain all day. And there's your mountain forecast up to 56 for the high after a freezing start and another freeze on the way for the mountains Thursday night into early Friday. Ben, Amy. All right, Christy, thank you. The NFL and iHeart Media will be partners for a podcast network. Interesting. The league yeah. already produces podcasts, of course, but the partnership for iHeart will lead to more of those, including versions that are produced by each of the teams. The NFL believes that this will, quote, supercharge their park podcasts. Apple unveiled new products at its spring launch event yesterday. The iPhone 12 now comes in purple. For all you purple fans, the iMac also got a makeover. The computer is slimmer and comes with Apple's new M1 chip. Apple also introduced AirTag, a tracking accessory. The Bluetooth device can be attached to items like your wallet. If you lose it, you can find it in the Find My app. Great idea there. Those are all really good looking. 
Well, meet Sylvie, the young orphan wombat. Looks like she's having a good old time playing with her caretaker. She's eight months old, and as you see, wombats are full of life and personality. They're moving all over the place. The caretaker says the video shows just how bouncy and full of energy she is. Whoa, oh. there she goes. Sylvie will stay where she is for another 12 months, and then she will be released back to the wild to run wild. Ooh, she likes her belly scratch, too, it looks like. <laughs> Stick around. Carolina's Family at Four is coming right back. We're still trying to figure out what a weenie whistle is and <laughs> what that exactly looks like. Anyway, time now for one of our favorite features of the show, Seven Kids. Uh, no problem figuring this out. The kiddos are so cute. We love your pictures. Keep sending them in. This one is coming from Allie Butler, and this is Zaylee modeling a new summer outfit. That is a good-looking outfit, and the bow makes the whole thing work so well. Remember, you can share your pictures or videos. Email them in to sevenkids at WSPA.com. She is so cute. Yes. Then. Enjoy it when they're young where you can dress them all up and they don't have any opinions. Right. Because when they become teenagers, then they want to pick out their own clothes. Absolutely. And you can so. dress alike, Mom. You know, you can do the Mom and Me outfit. But yeah. later on, they will never match you again. <laughs> it's never right. going to happen. That's going to wrap up Carolina's Family at 4. Live at 5 is on the way next. We will see you right back here tomorrow on Thursday. Have a great day.
Now on 7 News Live at 5, dozens displaced. We're learning more about a fire at an apartment complex in Anderson County. Investigating policing practices the day following the conviction of Derek Chauvin, federal officials now looking into Minneapolis police. Governor McMaster announces his last allocation of the gear fund. We'll tell you where that money is going. Lots to get to, but first, as always, let's head over to Chief Meteorologist Christy Henderson for that forecast first and beautiful day, yeah. but not good for the hair. Not good for the hair. <laughs> it's definitely been a windy one. Of course, yeah. fire danger is high and what's causing those strong winds is a cold front coming in tonight. Ah. So uh, that's going to bring